Bioethics Law Euthanasia Consumerism Politics Terrorism Globalization Religion Migrant Population Interfaith Drug Addiction Now, modern science has helped us gain a better understanding of our universe and improve our conditions of living. On the other hand, many people have the impression that modern science threatens the Christian faith. Many Christians wrestle with these questions. For example, how should Christians respond when their friends tell them that belief in God is based on ignorance to be, to be replaced when they have more scientific knowledge? How should parents respond when they watch documentaries with their children and are told that the universe began with the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago? How should students respond to teachers who tell them that Darwinian evolution has disproved the Bible? Now, not only Christians wrestle with these questions, non-Christians also wrestle with them as well. So, um, the late uh, uh, ex-Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, now, in one of his books, now, he has written this. He, he says, I, I won't call myself an atheist. I neither deny nor accept that there is a God. The universe, they say, came out of the Big Bang. But human beings on this earth have developed for the last 20,000 years and into thinking beings and are able to see beyond themselves and think about themselves. Is this the result of Darwinian evolution? Or is it God? I do not know. So I do not laugh at people who believe in God, but I do not necessarily believe in God nor deny that there could be one. So these are important questions, no, and many people wrestle with them, Christians and non-Christians. And therefore, it's important no, to uh, know how to approach uh, these questions. Now, in my book, I um, address these questions no, in seven chapters. The first chapter concerns different ways of relating science and Christianity. The second chapter talks about, is science the only way to knowledge? In chapter three, I address whether belief in God is based on ignorance. And here I answer that it is not based on ignorance, it's based on good reasons. Uh, and these reasons can be expressed in the form of the Kalam cosmological argument, as well as the teleological argument. This, uh, I'll explain this later. Okay? And having shown that there are good reasons to believe in God, I then answer the question whether belief in God hinders the progress of science. Is it the case that, okay, once we know that God created the universe, no, we can stop studying science, no, we really have to answer, and, no, we don't need to study science anymore? Again, I answer, uh, I answer in the negative. No, I say that belief in God does not hinder the progress of science. Now, if that's the case, then why is it that um, many people think that there is a conflict between science and Christianity? So we need to learn from the mistakes that Christians have committed in the past. Okay, this I address in chapter 5. And then I uh, conclude this book by addressing two very important issues in co the contemporary debate. The first being the age of the universe and dinosaurs. Now, how, how old is the universe? Now, how old is the Earth? Okay. And I also address the controversial issue of creation and evolution. Okay, so this is an overview of my book. Now let's uh, start with chapter one. Okay, in chapter one, I, address, uh, I introduce uh, different models of relating science and Christianity. The first model can be called the irreconcilability model or the, con or the conflict model, which basically says that you know, science and Christianity are in conflict. Okay. When science progress, it can replace religion. No, you don't need religion anymore. So these are always at war. Okay. This is the warfare model. And the second model is called the independence model, which says that you know, science and religion, science and Christianity, you know, they belong to different realms of knowledge. So science concerns facts. Uh, Religion, Christianity concerns moral values. You know, they don't overlap, you know, so they are totally separate. Okay, this is the second way of um, uh, thinking about uh, science and Christianity. Now, the third way of thinking about it is called the reconciliation model. Now, this model points out that Christianity does not just talk about morals only. Right? The, the Christian Bible also talks about the universe having a creator. Okay, the Christian Bible also says that you know, the universe has a beginning, right? The first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, and the Bible also says that you know, the, um, God's invisible attributes you know, can be seen you know, through understanding the creation. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Okay, so, um, and therefore, proponents of this model would say that if you study the Bible correctly, if you interpret it correctly, and if you study the natural world uh, correctly, these two should be Re reconcilable. No, they should be able to reconcile. No, they shouldn't be in conflict. Neither are they totally separate. No, they, they can be reconciled. Okay. 
So this is the reconciliation model. Now, I personally hold on to the third model. I think that uh, I hold the reconciliation model. And in my book, I point out that this model, in fact, has been affirmed by some of the greatest scientists in the history of science. Okay. Now, looking all the way back to the rise of modern science, okay, back to, uh, to the 16th century, where Johannes Kepler, you know, the father of modern astronomy, uh, and we have Blas Pascal, uh, hydrostatics, you know, the Robert Boyd, the father of modern chemistry, Isaac Newton, everybody knows about him, you know, father of modern physics. You know, all these uh, who's who of modern science, you know, some of the greatest scientists uh, in, in the world, these people who have contributed greatly to the progress of science. Many of these people are devout Christians. You know, they are devout Bible-believing Christians. Yeah. And they do think that science and Christianity can be reconciled. And even today, you know, we have uh, eminent scientists who are Christian. Okay, so, for example, the geneticist Francis Collins, the Cambridge physicist John Polkinghorne, and the Harvard astronomer Owen Giggory. Okay. So, uh, so, we, we, um, so I have given many examples of uh, you know, uh, eminent scientists who are Christians. But we also know that there are eminent scientists today who are not Christians. You know, they are atheists. Okay. So we want to know why, what is the reason why you know, they find it so difficult to believe in God, why they don't believe in God. Okay. So in chapter 2, I address you know, their, their reasons. Okay. Now, when we read their writings, we realize that many of these atheists, you know, they hold to the view that anything that can be known must be known scientifically. Okay. So for them, you know, science is the only way to knowledge. If you, if you want to know anything, you must be able to sh prove it scientifically. Okay. <coughs> So this kind of view is called scientism. Okay. Now we must pay attention that to this, the fact that scientism is actually not science. Okay. It's a philosophical view about science. Okay. It's saying that every, every, everything about nature, everything about reality must be known scientifically. Okay. So it's a philosophical view uh, that relates reality to science. Okay. It's not science itself, per se. Now, the word science has a variety of meanings. Uh, according to a wider definition, any discipline within the academy or the university could, in principle, be called science. Okay? Th uh, that's a wider definition. But for those atheists who oppose the religion, people like Richard Dawkins, uh, uh, they typically hold to a narrow definition of science, which is a systematic study of the natural world through observation and experimentation. So for these people, you know, they would say that you know, God is not something that you can that you can be shown to be shown to exist by experiments, right? You cannot put God in the test tube. You, know, you cannot do any experiment to show that God exists, and therefore uh, we cannot. You know, there's no good reason to know whether God exists or not. Okay? Because for them, they think that everything that can be, that, uh, can be known must be known scientifically, and there's no way to know whether God exists scientifically or not. Okay? So they think that there's no good reason to believe that God exists. Okay? And so they hold to this uh, to this view called scientism. <coughs> Now let's think critically about scientism. Okay. Now, as I pointed out earlier on, scientism is actually not science. It's a philosophical view of science and reality. And in fact, many scientists don't hold to scientism. Uh, there are atheist scientists who hold, it, who hold to it, but there are also atheist scientists who reject it. And of course, Christian scientists will reject this view as well. So scientism does not represent the view of all scientists. It only represents the view of a certain group of scientists. And in fact, it's a fallacious view. It, it, it can be shown to be false. Okay. Well, first of all, we can point out that you know, science is a great way of knowing. However, science cannot exclude the existence of entities which by their nature cannot be detected by the scientific method. Okay. So God is not supposed to be a natural entity that you can put into test tube to test. God does not behave in that way. Okay. So it, it will be fallacious you know, to try to detect God you know, by the scientific method, you know, because God, by his own nature, very nature, cannot be detected by the method. Okay? And so uh, science, cannot, science, has, science has its limitations. Okay? It cannot exclude the, the existence of entities which cannot be de detected by the scientific method. And moreover, science itself is based on certain philosophical principles. Okay? This is the second point. Okay? Uh, so uh, for, I have listed here a number of criteria for a good scientific theory. If you are a scientist, you know this. Okay? This, this is widely accepted you know, as a uh, criteria for good science. Well, what is a good scientific theory? A good scientific theory must be internally consistent, it must be simple, aesthetic appeal, intrinsic explanatory power, logical tightness, scope, okay? and also uh, extrinsic explanatory power connected to the rest of science, uh, extendability and testable, uh, able to make predictions that can be tested, uh, uh, and to be able to be confirmed, etc. You know, so these are the criteria. And if you look at this criteria, 
these criteria are actually by themselves not scientific but philosophical in nature, in that these criteria themselves cannot be proven to be correct by any experiments. So this criteria uh, is actually philosophical and the, the choice of this criteria is based on past experience combined with a philosophical reflection of what is the nature of reality. Okay? And therefore, science itself is actually based on philosophy and history. What this shows is that science cannot be the only way to know things. Okay? Because science itself requires philosophy and history. If science is the only way to know things, it will undermine itself. It will undermine itself. Okay? And therefore, uh, scientism is fallacious. Okay? Scientism is wrong. So what I have just shown is that there are actually various ways of reasoning. Okay? There is the scientific way of reasoning, but there's also a philosophical way of reasoning, and there's also a, a historical way of reasoning. Okay? So science is not the only way to know reality. Okay? That is false. We have different ways of knowing. We have the scientific way, but we also have the philosophical way as well as the historical way. Now, which way of reasoning we use depends on what we are trying to find out. Okay? If you are trying to find out how the universe works, yeah, you can use the scientific method. But if you are trying to find out whether there is a transcendent entity beyond the material universe, you should use philosophical reasoning. You can use deductive, inductive, causal reasoning, which is required by science anyway. This forms the basis of science. And if you are trying to find out whether Jesus resurrected or not, you should use historical reasoning, because it's an event that happened in the past. And therefore, you know, sometimes it, it amuses me you know, to read uh, some atheists you know, when, when they say, you know, oh, I cannot prove the resurrection of Jesus scientifically. That's why, that's why I don't believe. Okay. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. You know? okay. So if we know what we're talking about, if we know uh, uh, the ways that we think about things, uh, then we realize that uh, there are different ways of thinking, you know, different ways of reasoning for different uh, things that we are trying to find out about. Okay. And uh, therefore, uh, scientism is false. There are different ways of knowing about things. Now, is belief in God based on ignorance then? Okay. So many atheists today think that you know, belief in God is just based on ignorance. No? Oh, because I don't know how to explain how the universe came about, therefore I say that there's God. Okay. Oh, because I don't know how to explain how life originated, therefore I say there is a God. That's how they think we think. Okay. That's how they think we think. No? They think that, oh, that's, that's what religious believers think. No? It's all based on ignorance because we don't know how, therefore we say it's God. And once we know how, we don't need to believe in God. Okay. And that's why they think that when science progress, it will replace God. Okay? That's the, the reasons the atheists uh, re frequently gave. Now, is that true? Is belief in God merely based on ignorance? In chapter 3 of my book, I argue that that is not the case. Okay? I argue that there are the, you know, believing in God is not based on ignorance, but based on reasons, based on good reasons. And in this uh, little book, I discuss, two, um, I discuss two arguments, two reasons for believing in God. The first is the cosmological argument, and the second is the teleological argument. So let me briefly uh, introduce the teleological argument, which is the argument for design, for a designer. Now, we can start by observing the universe and ask ourselves these questions. Now, why is there order within the galaxies, within the solar system? Now, we know that um, the, the physical bodies in the universe move according to a certain orderly way. Okay? No, but why is that so? No, why, why is there such order? And why is it that this order can be described by elegant and mani intricate mathematical equations? Now, if you are a scientist, if you study science, you will know that you know, there are all these uh, equations okay, which describes how the universe works. Okay? For example, E equals mc squared. I'm sure all of us know about this. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Now, why is that so? No. Who, who or what you know, determined that the universe should be like this? Einstein didn't determine this equation. Einstein merely discovered this equation. Before Einstein discovered this equation, this equation has been there all along. Okay? So who or what put it there? Now, if the universe just came by random chance, then in the words of Einstein himself, we should expect a chaotic world, which cannot be grasped by the mind in any way. No. Even if man proposes the axioms of a scientific theory, the success of such a project presupposes a high degree of ordering in the objective world. And this could not be expected a priori. If the universe is by chance, then it should be totally chaotic. But why is it so ordered? Why is it so intelligent? Why is it so rational? Einstein thinks that that is a miracle. That's a miracle which is being constantly reinforced as our knowledge of science expands. So this is 
uh, the, the act of God. Huh? There must be a designer, a creator, who determined that the universe should be like this. Okay. So the argument, argument is that you know, the universe does not have to be like this, but why is it like this? Now, why do mindless and unintelligent physical entities consistently behave in such a rational and orderly manner? Now, and the conclusion is that there must be an intelligent designer who determined that the universe should be like this. Okay. So these are good reasons to believe that there must be a creator of our universe. There must be a god. Now let me move on quickly to the second argument, which is the cosmological argument. And this argument tries to answer the question, where do everything come from? Now, where is the ultimate origin of everything? Okay. Now, if you ask me where do I come from, uh, I can tell you that well, I came from my parents. Okay. And if you ask me where my parents came from, I say that no, they came from my parents' parents, my grandparents. And where did my grandparents came from? You know, they came from my great-grandparents. Okay. And you know, small children, they dare to ask. Uh, where, we keep on asking, right? Where did I come from? Where did I come from? You know, they want to find out the bottom of things. Now, you know, if you keep asking, you know, we, we can go all the way back okay, to where, where did the first human come from? Where did the first life come from? Where did the earth come from? Where did the solar system come from? And where did the universe come from? You know, and if, if you say that the universe came from the Big Bang, then where did the Big Bang come from? You can keep on asking that. Okay. And what we want to find out is whether there can be an infinite regress. Okay. Can you keep on asking forever? Can you keep on going into the past forever? Okay. Can there be an infinite regress of causes without a beginning? And the answer is no. You cannot have a, there cannot be an infinite regress of causes and effects. Okay. And the, the, the reason, you know, there, are, there are many reasons for, for, for why this is impossible. Okay. Let me just share one reason. Okay. One of the reasons why there cannot be an infinite regress of causes and effects is because it is impossible to traverse an actual infinite. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? So let me illustrate with an example. Now, I have three daughters. Okay. So they are the first generation of my descendants. And if they get married no, and have children, that will be the second generation of my descendants. Okay. So the number of generations can increase. You know, we can have three generations, four generations, five generations, six generations, but you can never reach an actual infinite. Okay? Because no matter how many generations you have read, we have reached, okay, you can still add one more. Right? So if we have reached 1,000 generations, you can still add one more. 1,001. If we have reached 1 billion generations, you can still add one more. 1 billion and 1. Okay? So what this shows is that you cannot reach an actual infinite you know, um, by a sequential pr uh, process. You know, it is impossible. And since that is the case, we could not have reached the present moment in time from an infinite past. Okay? Because if the past were infinite, we would be required to traverse an actual infinite. But I've already shown that that is not possible. Okay? And therefore, the past could not have been an infinite. The past must have a beginning. Okay? And therefore, there must be a first cause of the universe. Okay. Now, why is, it, why is this first cause? Okay. Now, first of all, well, the first, first cause obviously must be uncaused, right? <laughs> okay. So if the first cause were caused by other things, then it won't be the first. Okay. But we have already shown, that, we have already shown that there cannot be an infinite regress, and therefore there must be a first cause, which, is, which must be uncaused. Okay. Um, and secondly, the first cause must be without beginning and timeless. Why? Because everything that begins to exist has a cause. You can't have a, a lion or a tiger and suddenly begin to exist without a cause. No, that's not possible. Okay. So everything that begins to exist must have a cause. And since the first cause has a cause, it must be without beginning. And it must transcend time. Okay? Because everything that exists in time has a beginning and has a cause. So the first cause must be uncaused and must be without beginning and must be beyond time. Moreover, the first cause must be initially changeless. Because, again, you cannot have an infinite regress of change. Okay. And fourthly, the first cause must also have what we call free will. Okay. Now, why is it that so? Because for the first cause to cause the first events in time, okay, the first cause must be able to freely choose to move by itself. Okay. It, couldn't, it, must be, it must have the capacity to be the originator of the first effect in a way that is undetermined by prior events since the first cause is the first. Okay. So it must be able to initiate change uh, by itself, and it must also have the capacity to prevent itself from changing, for otherwise the first cause will not have been initially changeless. And this capacity to initiate change and to, re to prevent itself from changing describes what philosophers call libertarian free will. 
It must have free will. It must be able to choose to move and choose not to move, and able to choose not to move. Okay. This is and refrain from moving. So this is what we philosophers call free will. So it must have free will, and since everything that has free will is a personal agent, the first cause must be a personal agent too. And moreover, the first cause must have been highly intelligent, okay? because it, uh, the first cause is the source of the order of the universe, which can be described by elegant and intricate mathematics, which we have described earlier on. And finally, the first cause must also be enormously powerful and the ultimate source of all things in the universe, okay? because the first cause is the first. And therefore, what you have here is a first cause that is uncaused, without beginning, timeless, has free will, highly intelligent, and the ultimate source of all things, and highly powerful. What do you call that? <laughs> God. <laughs> yes. Yeah. My, my children know that too. <laughs> they can also answer, yeah, God. There must be a God. <laughs> okay. And therefore, a God must exist. There must be a God. No. Uh, a personal creator of the universe must exist. No. Otherwise, the universe wouldn't have existed. No. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Okay, to talk about God, and so that, that uh, you, know, uh, I've, you know, you can prove that uh, a God must exist. And since God is the ultimate source of our existence, it is only in Him that we can possibly find the ultimate meaning and purpose of our lives. Okay. So praise God, you know we can know Him. Okay, let me go on to talk about chapter four of my book. Now I've already shown that there are very good reasons to believe that there must be a God. Now, does belief, that, does belief in God hinder the progress of science? Okay. And the answer is no. Okay. Why? Because we can treat science as a discovery of the processes by which the creator created the universe and how created things operate. Okay. So believing that, that there's a creator to the universe does not hinder us from studying how the universe works. Just like believing that you know, um, my, my Porsche car you know, has a creator doesn't stop me from studying how the car works, right? So we can treat science as a, as a study of the processes by which you know, the universe came about by, and by, by which the, the, the universe works. Okay? So there's, there's no problem there. Now, why then do many people think that science and Christianity are in conflict? Well, I have really pointed out some of the reasons. Right? Some of the reasons is because you know, they hold on to uh, some fallacious philosophy, scientism, okay? which is fallacious. Right? So that's one reason. But there's also another reason, which is uh, the mistakes that Christians have made you know, in the past. Okay. These ha mistakes have hindered non-believers you know, from believing in Christ, in, in God. Okay. And I shall talk about some of these mistakes. Now, what are some of these mistakes? Now, one of the mistakes is to take passages in the Bible which do not necessarily have to be interpreted in a certain way and say that this must be interpreted in a certain way. Okay. Now, we need to understand that all texts need to be interpreted. Okay, and the Bible is no exception. Okay. And throughout history, theologians have recognized different kinds of meaning in the Bible. Literal, metaphorical, allegorical, symbolic. Uh, accommodation to common way of thinking, expressions, uh, etc. Now, it's interesting to note that the 3rd century Bible exegete, okay, ori origin, okay, he said this uh, in the 3rd century, before the rise of modern science. He says that for who has that has understanding will suppose that the first, second, and third day and the evening of the morning of Genesis chapter 1 existed without, without the sun and the moon and the stars. And the first day as, was, as it were, also without the sky. And if God is said to walk in paradise in the evening, in Genesis chapter 3, and Adam to hide himself under a tree, I do not suppose that anyone doubts that these things figuratively indicate certain mysteries, the history having taken place in appearance and not literally. That is to say, you know, Biblical passages in Genesis chapter one and three, for example, those passages that says that you no know, God walk, walk, right, walk in the cool of the day. Okay. We are not supposing we are, that God really have two legs, right, and that He walk in the garden. <laughs> okay, because we know that God is a spirit, right? God is not a physical body, you know, that walk that. Right? So, so we can interpret this not literally, but you know, um, having taken place in form of appearance you know, is as if you know, God is walking through there. You know, that the presence of God can be sensed you know, in the Garden of Eden you know, in that kind of way, you know, but it's not to be taken literally. So it's to be uh, understood phenomenologically, okay, in the appearance, okay, but not literally. Now, looking at the history of science and Christianity interaction, uh, a very important incident that we need to pay attention to is the Galileo incident, which happened in the 17th century. Now, I'm sure uh, most of us here will, will know about this incident, incident right? So, um, 
the church at that time taught that you know, the, earth, the, the sun goes around the earth. Okay? But Galileo defended uh, Copernicus' theory, which is that the earth goes around the sun. Okay? So there is a conflict here. Are we to understand this as science versus the Bible? Or science versus tradition? Tradition, tradition uh, ways of interpreting the Bible? Okay, which is it? Now, when we look at passages from the scriptures, for example, in the Psalms, okay, Psalms 19, okay, it, it says that, you know, that there's this verse which says that in them, God has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. His rising is from one end of the heavens, circuit to the other end of them. And there's nothing that is hidden from his heat. Now, the Pope, in the, during the 17th century, interpret this uh, as saying that you know, it is the sun going around the earth. But nowadays, I'm sure none of us interpret it this way. Right? We can say that you know, this can be understood as an accommodative and phenomenological expression describing how the movement of the sun appears to people on earth. And in fact, when we look at the context of this passage, you know, it is quite clear that you know, it is not to be taken literally. I'm sure none of us will suppose that the sun is really like a bright, is really a bridegroom, right? <laughs> the sun doesn't get married. No? The sun has no wife. Okay. So this is, you know, appears like a bridegroom you know, coming out. You know, it's appearance. It, you know, it, uh, it's talking about appearance here. You know, it comes from, appears to come from one end to the other end. Okay. So we, we must uh, under, understand, interpret this correctly. So just as passages you know, uh, like a bridegroom, you know, it's not to be taken literally. Likewise, such phenomenological expressions should not be taken literally. So even today, we, people still use exp expressions of the sun going around the earth, you know, like sunrise, sunset, etc. You know, but we're not taking this literally. So even Galileo himself didn't think that there was a conflict you know, between science and the Christian faith. He says that uh, the scriptures, the Bible, accord perfectly with demonstrated physical truth. But let those theologians who are not astronomers guard against uh, rendering the scripture false by trying to interpret against uh, propositions which might, we may be true and might be proved so. Okay, so Galileo himself recognized that there are different ways of interpreting those Bible passages. You know, and <coughs> there is not necessarily a conflict. Okay? But it's very sad that you know, the Christians, uh, many of the Christians during his time, including the Pope, uh, rejected uh, his ideas no, and insisted that there is a conflict between what they say and what Galileo said. Okay? And this has led to tragic consequences. No? There are many people rejecting the Christian faith no, because of issues like this. So we need to learn from the mistakes of the past. No? And we must really guard ourselves no, from repeating these mistakes again. I apply this lesson no, to two issues okay, in our contemporary discussions. The first concerns the age of the universe and the earth. And the second concerns the issue of creation and evolution. Now, concerning the age of the universe and, uh, uh, and the earth, we recognize that different Christians have different views. Okay? And I would expect that even among the audience today, the audience here today, deep, 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 um, many of you will have different views. Okay? Some of you will hold to young creationism, some of, them, some of you all will hold to old creationism. Uh, different people have different views. Okay? Um, in the 17th century, you know, the Bishop Usher you know, thinks that the universe originated you know, in 4004 BC, and then there's Young Creationism, which says that you know, it's not 4004, but it's, also, it, but it's not too old. You know? It's probably 10,000 years or at most 20,000 years. And we also have uh, this day-age creation, which is a long day's creation, you know, saying that each of the days could be a long period of time. And there's another theory, which is called, another way of interpreting uh, the Genesis account, which is called the gap theory, okay? which says that there is a gap of unknown duration between um, the first verse and the second verse of Genesis. This is the traditional gap theory. And nowadays, uh, there are uh, some scholars, such as John Lennox uh, at uh, Oxford University, he suggests that there might be gaps between each of the day as well. Okay? So between day one and day two, there might be a gap. Between day two and day three, there might be a gap. No? Uh, it is possible. And there's also another view called the literary framework view, which points out that the construction of Genesis uh, can be understood uh, uh, in a poetic way, in a literary framework, you know, and you don't have to understand uh, it chronologically. And finally, there's also another view called the functional creation view, which says that the, the word bara in Genesis chapter 1, which is translated as create, you know, God created the heavens and the earth create. Now, the word create can be taken as a 
functional creation rather than ontological creation. Meaning that the entities could have already existed in a certain state, but God made them uh, functional, to make them function in a certain way with, re with respect to his purposes uh, of wanting to set up a cosmic temple in the Garden of Eden for man to worship him. Okay. So this passage has to be understood in that way, in the light of God's uh, greater purposes. And that's how he interprets the word uh, creation, create, okay, uh, in Genesis chapter 1 to 3. So I, I, wouldn't have t I, I don't have the time to explain these views in detail. Okay, you can check out this uh, little book, okay, which explains that. But I just want to highlight the fact that you know, different Christians have different views about this. Okay? And we shouldn't be dogmatic you know, about this. You know, we shouldn't say, oh, it must be interpreted this way. You know? um, because the fact, that, the fact is that it doesn't have to be interpreted in a certain way. You know? And we must be careful of the mistakes that Christians have made in the past. You know? Uh, which is to say that, which is you know, to insist that a passage has to be interpreted in a certain way, in a certain way, when it doesn't have to be interpreted in a certain way. You know? So we have to be very careful about that okay, to learn this mistake, in order not to cause any stumbling block you know, to people trying to you know, uh, come to know more about uh, Christianity. Okay? Now, a very important point that we need to pay attention to is that Genesis chapter one to three is not intended to be a complete account of everything about creation. Okay. For example, why was the earth formless and void near the beginning of chapter 1 in verse 2? Okay. The Bible itself actually does not say. No, Genesis chapter 1 to 3 does not tell us why is it that the earth was formless and void. Now, in, in the original Hebrew, formless and void means you know, um, to be functionless, you know, without function, you know, not fruitful. You know. So it is not a desirable state. Okay. But why was the earth like that. No. Would God have created a fruit, fruitless, uh, unfruitful earth, no, a, a functionless earth? Or could there have been some events that took place before that? Okay. Maybe the, the fall of the angels. No. Um, that, that could be possible. I'm not saying that it must be uh, that way, but it could be possible. No. But uh, whatever the case, the Bible doesn't really tell us okay, in the opening chapters of Genesis. And again, you know, why was the snake evil? Okay. Now, the snake appeared in chapter 3. Uh, and you know, we know that the snake symbolizes the devil, Satan. Okay. Uh, some people take it, the snake literally. Some people don't take the snake literally. But whether you take it literally or not, you know, the Bible does not tell us why was the snake evil. Why was the snake a deceiver? You know? We know from other chapters in the Bible, in, Reve in Revelation chapter 12, you know, it tells us that the, the, the serpent, right? was Satan, the devil. But this answer was not revealed in the opening chapters of Genesis. It doesn't tell us. So within the text of the scriptures itself, we, can, we, we notice that you know, Genesis chapter 1 to 3 is not intended to, to be a complete account of everything. And, that, and, and therefore, uh, concerning the details of how God created the universe, for example, how much time he actually took Different interpretations are possible, you know, that, um, and different gaps are possible. You know, there, there could be gaps you know, in between the, the verses or the days. You know, these are all possible because the, it's not a complete account of everything. But these different interpretations do not affect the main message of the text, which is that God is the creator you know, uh, and that he was behind each step of creation. And thus, humans should not worship created things. You know, we shouldn't worship the sun, the moon, the stars, because these things are not gods. You know, these things are made by God. You know, and we should worship the creator himself, because he alone deserves to be worshipped. And he also has a special plan for humanity. Okay? So this is the main message, the core message of the opening chapters of Genesis. And we can understand them perfectly well, okay, without having to... You know, to um, bother too much about how, how long does God take, you know, all this, because those are, not the main, those are not the main message of the text. Okay? So uh, different interpretations of Genesis 1 does not affect us understanding the main message of the text. Now, uh, finally, I, ended my, I end my book by discussing about creation and evolution. Now, this is a highly controversial issue is very hot, uh, is, uh, hotly debated you know, in many parts of the world today. Because some Christians do believe that God could have created uh, biological life using the process of evolution. Okay. 
Now, in order to understand why that is so, we need to understand that the word evolve, evolution, uh, these words can have different meanings. Okay? Now, it, it can mean biological change over time, which nobody denies. No, there is definitely biological change over time. It can also mean the life forms today came from earlier ones. It can also mean genetic variation and natural selection, okay? which is uh, commonly called microevolution. So the fact that there's some adaptation going on you know, in species. Now again, this nobody denies, right? We all agree that there are some adaptive changes okay, in living organisms, okay, in, uh, involving the process of genetic variation and natural selection. Now what is controversial is the fourth and the fifth point. Okay? The fourth meaning of the term is uh, referring to the process involving the mechanisms of genetic variation and natural selection by which the present diversity of plant and animal life arose from a common ancestor. From a simple life form, no, uh, evolves un, uh, and results in the present diversity of life forms. Okay. So this is known as uh, uh, macroevolution. And then there is also uh, what is called naturalistic evolution or theistic evolution, which is the view that the universe and all life came about without God. Okay. Now, it is important to note the distinction between four and five. Because many people today think that evolution equals to atheism. Many people think that that is the case. But actually, that is not the case. Because there's a difference between four and five, which we need, we need to pay attention to. Four by itself does not say whether there is a God or not. It could be that there is a God who uses the process involving mechanisms of genetic variation and natural selection to bring about the present diversity of life. Okay. So four is open to the possibility that there could be a God behind the process of evolution. Whereas five <coughs> says that no, there, is, there isn't God. No? It, everything just came about naturally without God. Okay. So this distinction is very important. Okay. We need to pay attention to this distinction. And uh, we need to also recognize that Charles Darwin himself was never an atheist. So many people today might have the misconception that Darwinism equals atheism. No, Darwin was an atheist, but he was never an atheist. He never denied that there's a God, actually. Uh, Darwin himself actually holds to fall. And even after publishing The, origin of, or the Origins of Species in 1859, he, for, for some years, no, he still said that there's a creator no, he, uh, who, who uh, created using the process of evolution. But towards the end of his life, he became an agnostic. Okay. Um, Meaning that you know, he's not sure whether there's a God or not. But he never denied that there's a God. He never said that there's no God. He never said that. So why is it the case that many people think that atheism, uh, uh, sorry, Darwinism equals atheism? Why, why, why that idea? Where did that idea come from? The idea didn't come from Darwin himself. That idea was popularized by Karl Marx. Karl Marx uses, used the Darwinian evolution to support his materialistic philosophy. His... Uh, uh, communist ideas, you know? and that uh, has huge impact you know, on the world. You know, it, it spread to the Russia, it spread to China, you know? and therefore you know, many people, many, many people in mainland China thought, think that you no, know, there's no God. Evolution has shown that there's no God, but actually all these are misconceptions. You know? The interior of evolution by itself you know, does not say that. Okay? okay, so we need to pay attention to this uh, distinction. <clears throat> now, so concerning four, whether there is a God behind. No, uh, concerning four, um, different Christians have different views. Okay? So some Christians would disagree, would say that no, we are not open to the idea of God using evolution to create. Okay? So some Christians have called this view, uh, including uh, those scientists at the Discovery Institute, uh, Stephen Meyer, and also uh, Hugh Ross, uh, who uh, set up the organization called the Reasons to Believe. Uh, they argue that there's insufficient evidence for macroevolution. No, they they uh, argue that no, they are, there's a lack of transitional forces. So um, what they are trying to say is that if all the present day life forms come, came from a common ancestor, we should see many transitional life forms in between the simple life form and the complex life forms. Okay. But we, when we look at the fossil record, we find that there's actually a lot of missing links, missing gaps. Okay. And therefore, no, they reject this. Okay. Uh, and this uh, lack of transitional forces is uh, very evident during what is called the Cambrian explosion, which is uh, between 570 to 530 million years ago. Now, however, there are other Christians who would say that four 
okay, merely describes a process which God could use, to, to, could choose to use to create various life forms. And these Christians include such eminent theologians as Benjamin Warfield, who, by the way, is the father of modern day fundamentalism, interestingly. Because we know that modern day fundamentalist Christians reject evolution very staunchly. But Benjamin Warfield himself was open to evolution. Okay? Uh, he defended the inerrancy of scripture very passionately. And in more recent times, we have C.S. Lewis, whom I'm sure all of you know, you know the most, one of the most popular Christian writers and apologists. And uh, John Stott, you know, one of the most eminent uh, biblical scholars. Uh, Alistair McGrath, J.I. Packer, John Walton, N.T. Wright, uh, Tim Keller. William Lane Craig is open to the possibility of evolution too. You know, he says that on theological grounds, it is possible. You know, although he himself is skeptical about evolution on scientific grounds, okay, but that's a different issue. Okay. But on theological ground, you know, he thinks that, you know, yeah, it's possible God could have chosen to uh, do that. And we have uh, big denominations like the United Presbyterian Church, Lutheran World Federation, uh, and also the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, they accepted uh, that, the idea that God could choose to use evolution to create various life forms. Now, we need to understand what are the reasons why these Christians say that. Okay? And the reason is, okay, we, first of all, we need to note that there are different levels of explanations. Okay? So for example, when we read the Psalms, uh, for example, Psalm 139 verse 13, which says that, For you, God, form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. Okay? Now, when we read passages like this, you know, and we think about you know, modern uh, embryology, which has sh shown to us you know, how uh, the embryo can be formed by a process which involves you know, the genes. You know. yeah. Now, the discovery of the scientific process of uh, embryology does not contradict this verse. Okay. Why? Because we can say that the discovery of this process is uh, merely describing the process by which God used to form the embryo. Okay. Okay, so there are different levels of explanation. Okay, there's the scientific level, but there's, there's also a, a level that's beyond that, which is you know, what, what caused science, right? What, what caused those natural laws? Who created the DNA? You know, where did the universe come from? Why, why does the, the nature work, work in this way? Okay, so we can say that God set up the laws of nature and used these laws to bring about the embryo. You know? different kind of life. Okay, so there are different levels of explanation. And it's interesting to note that the Hebrew words, the same Hebrew words, yadza and asa, okay, which is translated as create, made, you know, form okay, in the Genesis. These <coughs> words which describe the nine month long process of development from two single cells, okay, the sperm and the egg, into a fully formed human being are used to describe the earth creation of different types of animals as well, okay, in, direction, in direct response to God's command. In other words, in the emergence of plant and animal life through earth history, we find the same general trajectory as the formation of an embryo in the womb. First single cells, then multicellularity, and then more complex organisms. The exact same Hebrew words, asa and yasa, that describes God's forming of embryos in the womb and God's forming of plant and animal life are used to describe God's forming of the human species. And therefore, the use of these words implies, or at least does not rule out, that God forming humankind was a process and not an instantaneous event. Okay. Because we know that the creation of the embryo was not an instantaneous event, right? It takes nine months okay, for an embryo to form. Okay. And therefore, the creation of life forms and human beings you know, can also be a process. You know, it does not have to be, you know, God created instantaneously. It doesn't have to be like that. Okay. It could be a, a, a process as well. The same Hebrew words are used. Okay, so this is a very important to take notes. And so, um, you know, when we look at this process, you know, the Old Testament scholar Bruce Wocky observes that Genesis is concerned with ultimate cause, the ultimate level of explanation, which is God. You know, God is behind the order of the universe. You know, he's the ultimate cause, first cause of everything. Okay, so when the psalmist says, God need me to gather in my mother's womb, in Psalm 139 verse 13, 139 verse 13 the psalmist is not intending to comment on genetics or intermediate cause. Okay? And likewise, in Genesis, the narrator only tells us that God commands the earth to bring forth life. Okay? He does not explain how that bringing forth occurs. So this is a very important theological point that we need to pick, take note of. 
And so, I'm sure we can all accept this. Okay. But why, so why not accept this? Okay. Now, it is, it is because of these reasons that Benjamin Warfield, okay, the father of modern fundamentalism, say that there is no question as to the compatibility of Darwinian form of evolution, uh, of evolution with Christianity. He thinks that it is perfectly compatible. And what this implies is that Christians can believe in evolution. Okay. In fact, I have already highlighted many examples of Christians who do believe in evolution, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, um, Tim Keller, you know, uh, all these people. So Christians can believe in evolution, but they don't have to. Okay. If you don't believe, that's fine. Okay. We are not going to force you to, your pastor is not going to force you to believe in evolution. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can have the freedom to believe or the freedom not to believe. Okay. Uh, I think Christians can have the liberty at this point. Okay, so with regards to the creation of humans, now, you know, some people are troubled by the idea of human beings coming about, coming about by the evolution process. But we need to pay closer attention to the biblical text, okay, to Genesis chapter 1, in order to understand what is a human. According to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, it tells us that the humans are created in the image of God. Okay? And it's crucial to understand what is meant by this. What does the image of God mean? Okay? Now, we mustn't go away with the idea that the image of God refers to a physical body. Okay? Because God is not a physical body. God is a spirit. Okay? So where the body comes from is not important, actually. Whether, the, whether our physical body came by the process of evolution or whether it, doesn't came from a, it didn't come from the process of evolution, that is not the crucial issue. Okay? The crucial issue is our spirit, our soul. Okay? God is a spirit. The image must be referring to the spiritual aspect rather than the bodily aspect of human. And what the image of God actually means is that humans are created to be representatives of God, you know, to represent God, to rule the earth, you know, to subdue the earth you know, in, in, the, in the place of God, you know, to, to, to be uh, the vice region of God, you know, to govern the world. You know, that is what the image of God means you know, in the Genesis text. Okay, so um, to represent God, you know, to have this uh, spiritual capacity uh, for that kind of work. So it doesn't refer to the body, it refers to the spiritual aspect of the human. Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says that you know, God formed the man of dust from the ground. Okay. Now, in the past, I used to interpret this verse as saying that you know, God took up the dust and then, whew, yeah, and then become a living being. Okay. It was an instant, instantaneous process. And I think many Sunday school uh, textbooks, you know, uh, when they draw pictures, you know, they draw it that way. You know, like, you know, that, as if God you know, forming dust, you know, like making a stand you know, dust. And then, you know. They, they try to use, use pictures, pictorial form, you know, to, to describe you know, that process. But actually, you know, this, this kind of description, you know, God forming the dust and then poof, instant is, this kind of description, this kind of pictures is not what the Bible says. The biblical text does not say that it must be it is, it is created in that way. You know. that, that is not biblical, actually. You know. Because when we look at the Bible, um, first of all, we understand that dust from the ground refers to the composition of the body, okay, not the process by which it is formed. And the word form, I mentioned earlier on, uh, in the original Hebrew, yatsa, okay? yatsa, which, as I explained earlier on, can refer to a process. It doesn't have to be an instantaneous event. Okay? It, could be a long, it could be a process. How long? We don't know. Okay? But it could be a process. Okay? So, whatever the case, you know, the word yatsa does not specify the process of formation. Okay? So, it could, be evolu it, it could be evolution, it could be not evolution, we don't know. But it's open to the possibility of evolution. Okay? It, is not, it doesn't reject the possibility. Now, Many Christians are concerned about uh, the phrase according to their kinds in Genesis chapter 1. Okay? It says that God created you know, the, the living things according to their kinds. Doesn't this imply a fixity of species? You know, God created tigers, God created lions. You know, tigers remain tigers, lions remain lions. You know, according to their kinds. Does, does it imply fixity of species? Actually, it doesn't. What uh, this phrase means, uh, in the original Hebrew, uh, lamin okay, is, the, is, the, is the phrase. Okay, lamin. Now, lamin can be understood as saying that God created various biological life forms fol following the kinds which he has planned. Uh, various, like, according to kinds, according to various kinds. Uh, two kinds, create two kinds. So, God created various kinds. Okay. So, the Old Testament scholar Richard Hess at Denver Seminary, you know, he says that this phrase you know, simply say that God created various biological life forms, but it does, it does not specify the process of creation, nor does it exclude the possibility that God could allow certain creatures of a particular kind to evolve into another kind, so, so as to bring about various kinds of creatures which he has planned. Okay. So again, you know, it does not exclude the possibility of uh, the evolutionary process. So 
what I've argued so far is that um, no, the, the biblical text actually does not exclude the possibility of evolution. And therefore, um, for us Christians, when we approach this text, I think we must be, chari we must be open to different possible interpretations. No? We must be charitable okay, to, other, to some Christians who might want to embrace evolution. No? We, we shouldn't say that they are heretics. No? We, shouldn't, no? we must be charitable to these Christians. No? Um, people like Tim Keller, C.S. Lewis, no? we don't want to say that they are heretics. No? John Stott. No? Okay. So I, I think we, we must be uh, uh, charitable. I think we shouldn't be dogmatic okay, about any particular interpretation. We need to be open to different possibilities okay, because the text itself you know, does not demand that we must embrace you know, any particular view. Okay? So uh, there are different possibilities and we must also be careful about the lesson of history which has taught us you know, not to be dogmatic you know, when the text itself does not require us to be dogmatic. Okay. Having said that, okay, I want to point out that evolution cannot account for the origin of the universe, the origin of the order of the universe as, uh, as, as well as the origin of life. Okay? So evolution cannot be a complete story of how everything came about. Right? Because evolution you know, only, only tells us you know, how living creatures can evolve from a simpler life form. It does not tell us where did the first life came from. And it also doesn't tell us you know, how could the first life came about. You know? Because in order for the first life to, to come about, you know, the universe must already exist. Right? And the universe must have certain order okay, in order for natural selection to be even possible. Where did that order come from? Where did the universe come from? So we are back to the issue of first cause. You know, where did everything come from? And I've already shown that there are good reasons to believe that there must be a first cause, who is an uncaused, you know, beginningless, timeless creator. Okay, so, whether you, so whether someone accepts evolution or not, you know, he cannot escape from the conclusion that there must be a creator of the universe, and who also designed the laws of the universe you know, uh, in order for life to be possible in this universe. Okay. So the conclusion of a creator cannot be avoided by evolutionary theories. Okay. So whether there is evolution or not, you know, there must be a God. <laughs> okay, there must be a God. Okay, that, that's the point. Okay. And in fact, the origin of life is such a huge problem you know, for naturalistic evolution okay. uh, that Anthony Flew, who was one of the most eminent atheist philosophers of the 20th century, you know, for 40 over years, you know, he tell students all around the world that there's no God. There's no God. Okay. But in 2005, you know, he changed his mind. You know, and he says that, yeah, okay, I finally come to believe that there must be a God. <laughs> and the reason why is because you know, he, he chose to pay closer attention to the issue of the origin of life. You know. Where did the first DNA come from? Where did the first functional DNA come from? You know, that, you know, in order for that to come about, you know, he, he, he explained that what I think is that the DNA material has done is that it has shown by almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangement which are needed to produce life, that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinary diverse elements to work together. Okay? Because the DNA is a very complicated code. Okay? To get these different chemical elements you know, to form together into a workable code, you know, it, it, it couldn't have come about by chance. It, it couldn't have come about. And not only that, it, not only that you need uh, the code you know, to have a code, but that is not enough. You, you also need to have a decoding mechanism. Something that can understand the code, you know, that, that can translate the code into something workable. You know? Just like you know, if you have a computer software, that is not enough to work, right? You also need to have a hardware, a hardware that can decode, that can understand the software you know, in order you know, for it to be functional. So how can all these things you know, come together by chance? You know? It's like setting up a factory by chance. You know? It's impossible. It, it couldn't have occurred uh, naturalistically. And therefore, uh, Anthony Flew, you know, uh, because of uh, the evidence of this, you know, he has chosen to believe that, you know, the, uh, um, believe that, you know, that there must be a designer, there must be a creator to bring these elements together. Okay. He could use various processes. Okay. Some scientists think that you know, there, there could be some DNA uh, chemical, uh, some elements that eventually resulted in the DNA in outer space, whatever, but there must be a creator who brings all these things together you know, in order to form you know, this workable DNA. Uh, if, and it's the coding mechanism, the first life. Okay, so there must be a God. And what the DNA has shown us you know, is that life is really amazing. You know, it's amazing that we can all be sitting here today. You know, this is amazing. You know. So when we look at uh, life, when we look at creation, you know, we can really uh, agree with the psalmist you know, when he says, you know, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the awesome universe with billions of stars working in this remarkable order, you, know, you can say that you know, what is man that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? And we can 
also you know, uh, agree with the psalmist you know, when he says, the heavens declare the glory of God you know, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Okay. You know, the evidence for God is so uh, evident you know, in the creation, in the nature. But it is very sad that in, you know, nowadays, you know, many people fail to see the glory of God in creation. And the reason why they fail to see the glory of God in the natural world is because of bad philosophy, you know, scientism, you know, bad philosophy. It's because of many misconceptions that they have you know, about Christianity. And some of these misconceptions have been caused by Christians ourselves. Okay? So we also have a part, you know, we also should bear some of the blame. You know, we shouldn't just blame the atheists, you know, but we have caused some of the misconceptions. You know. Um, by you know spreading pseudoscience, you know, by telling people, oh, you know, you must believe in six days, uh, six literal days, uh, as in six twenty-four hour days, you know, that kind of thing. You know, uh, so the, the way the, the way that Christians have defended their faith you know, is uh, quite problematic you know, sometimes. It has caused many people to be put off you know, by this kind of approach, you know, thinking that you know, Christians are ignorant, you know, they are really unscientific, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. You know. um, so it's, it's sad to see that happening. You know. It's sad to see people being put off by Christianity uh, in, in that way. Um, so what I pray is that you know, my book will help okay, to clear away some of this bad philosophical thinking, you know, some of these misconceptions, clear away these obstacles you know, so that um, more Christians can be strengthened in their faith and that more people can come to see the glory of God you know, which is manifested in creation and to embrace Jesus Christ you know, as their Lord and as their Saviour. Thank you.